Hello, I've got a short video here all about the shape of the universe. I'm hoping to do three things. Firstly, I want to plant some doubt in your mind that what all the physicists in the world are telling NASA is certain. Secondly, I want to create a little interest in what I might have to say about the shape of the universe. And thirdly and finally, I want to tell you what the shape of the universe means in practice. The thing about the shape of the universe is that it is like the picture on top of the box that contains the jigsaw. It allows you to make sense of the pieces of the jigsaw. There are an awful lot of pieces of the jigsaw that don't fit at the moment and that do fit once you know what the shape of the universe is. For example, the missing region here of the jigsaw is not itself a piece of the jigsaw. That's not how jigsaws work. So what we find is that there isn't a piece called dark energy. We find dark energy makes sense all on its own without, without needing further explanation. Inflation, which we saw in the previous in the previous picture from NASA, which seemed to imply that that was a, 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 a part of the framework of the picture, is not only not part of the framework, it's also, I would suggest, not a piece of the jigsaw. At the moment, we have uh, Han Solo's spaceship we have the USS Enterprise, we have good old Doctor Who and the Daleks, we have the Terminator, we have our dreams, which are great, great fun. But our dreams also need to be robust, they need to be durable, they need to endure. And earlier in our history, our dream was of a, a land of milk and honey for heaven. Uh, which turns out to be a bit of a child's dream. It's not really a grown-up version of a dream. And we've superseded that with our grown-up version of a dream. But our grown-up version of a dream is still a little bit materialistic because it's kind of saying, well, as soon as I get rich, I'll, I, all my problems will be solved, which, of course, never works out to be, to be quite like that. And the dream that we kind of share at the moment and that physicists are trying to pursue is the dream of faster than light travel. But I would say faster than light travel is actually not as good as, as the reality, which is that getting out into space is going to be so difficult and take so long. It gives us a very specific destiny and it needs all of us to do it. And I would say that's a very positive vision. Hopefully that creates just a very, very small window of doubt and therefore a little bit of curiosity to pull us forward into the next section where I'm hoping to build on that hope and actually make you um, uh, hungry for the beauty, the elegance and the um, durability, the, the reality of the shape of the universe. I'm hoping you'll stay with me for the next two steps because where I'm going to be taking us is at the moment we know the universe is approximately 14 billion years old. We know that it's approximately 93 billion light years wide and we know that the expansion rate is increasing. We don't really know why because we, we th those those are individual elements of the picture. They don't really fit together. Here's a very simple table of numbers, which, which is of interest to us because in this table, those numbers do fit together. At the point where you reach a universe that is approximately 14 billion years old, if the expansion rate is doubling, 
So one, two, four, six, sorry, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, hundred and twenty-eight. The midway point, the midway point between sixty-four and one hundred and twenty-eight is about ninety-six. The midway point between thirteen point zero and fifteen point zero is fourteen point zero. And 14 is only marginally bigger than 13.8. And 96 is only marginally bigger than 93. Furthermore, because the expansion rate here is changing, if, if, if people think the expansion rate is this rate, which it is, uh, uh, so that's the expansion so the expansion rate here is level with the expand with the uh, age of the universe here. If people think that's always been the expansion rate, they're going to be missing all of these increased expansions when they look back in time, which is how cosmologists see the universe. It's it's from a long time ago. The further away the, the further away you are. So the fact that so the apparent fact that ninety six percent of the matter of the universe is missing is explained if that matter is actually gravity caused by the expansion of the universe rather than gravity caused by mass. If it was gravity caused by mass, the mass would be missing. If it's gravity caused by expansion, by acceleration, it's not missing at all. It was there at the time. You just weren't, you just, you're looking at a series of stills. You should be looking at the film as a whole. Let's explain a little bit further about the expansion that I'm suggesting. So what I'm, so normally, when we talk about the expansion of the universe, we talk about it very simply in one of two ways. It's either an explosion, a big bang, like an exponential expansion, or it's an expanding balloon. It's a steady linear expansion. But what if it's neither of those? What if it's between those? It starts off as a maximum expansion, but then it reduces. And it reduces over time and it ends up it ends up as near as damn it to a balloon style linear expansion so that's a much more economical a much more elegant a much more appealing way to understand if you if you think of how god has built the universe he's built it she's built it in the most elegant optimal way not in the simplest possible way so rather like the difference between simple interest and compound interest what i'm suggesting is that we don't have simple expansion we have compound expansion it's not exponential it's not one two four eight sixteen i'm starting off with the simplest possible scenario i'm saying that the the size of the universe is one, the expansion rate is one, and over the in the first period of time, expansion doubles. But then in the second period of time, the expansion doesn't double again, it only increases by one and a half, and then by half as much again, 1.75, 1.8. And what's what's so so nice about this is that as time passes eventually the rate of expansion becomes insignificant and you settle down into what is effectively a linear expansion the same as if it was a balloon so this is a universe that has a very concrete purpose but it doesn't have a concrete end and i think that's i think that's almost as encouraging as the earlier discovery that we have a very very difficult but concrete purpose and it's going to take all of us 
we do need a step two because there's a there's a complication which is that the universe is expanding but it looks as if it's expanding at a, at a, at a at an ever increasing rate why is that why does it look as if it's expanding at an ever increasing rate when i'm saying it's actually expanding at an ever decreasing rate let me introduce you to Zeno's frog. Briefly, the story, if you don't know, the story is that Zeno, the philosopher, Greek philosopher, uh, said that, imagine a frog on a lily pad at the center of a lake trying to get out. With his first jump, he's able to jump half the distance to the edge of the lake. So he's thinking, great, I'm going to be out of this lake in a couple more hops, no problem. But he's a bit tired after his first hop so he says i'll make another jump it'll be half the distance i've now jumped three quarters of the way towards the edge no problem i'll be out of here in a couple of hops i'm a bit tired than i was makes another jump seven eighths of the way as zeno pointed out the paradox is that even though the frog is jumping half the distance every time it never escapes, it never gets out of the lake, never reaches the edge. So what that means is that although the expansion rate of the universe looks like the apparent size of the universe, looks like it's doubling, which is how we get to this 96 that I mentioned earlier, and it's also how we get the missing mass of the universe so high. In reality, it's not doubling at all, it's halving. A little more explanation on that. The frog, of course, isn't looking at the centre of the universe. Blaise Pascal said the centre of the universe is everywhere. How can you look at everywhere? It's easy to look at the edge of the universe. It's just the biggest, most furthest away part. So the frog is looking at the edge of the universe. Furthermore, it's not the frog that's moving. It's the lily pad. The lily pad is the thing that is moving away from the edge of the universe. The edge of the universe is always just the edge of the universe. So, so what this frog is seeing is every time the lily pad makes a, a half a, a hop inwards, all of these are doubling in size. Let's, let's take that a bit more slowly and look at it a different way. So the assumption is that everything is expanding, so the frog jumps a half the distance to the edge each time. That's a natural assumption to start off with. However, the intuition is that the, the intuition that Blaise Pascal had long before anybody knew anything about expansion and so forth. The intuition was that the lily pad is moving, not the frog. And so that, those half hops flip round at that point. Now, what do we do with the frog? Do we leave him at the edge of the universe? I don't think so. I think the, the frog needs to consider itself as being at the centre of the universe. Topologically, it's, it's not quite that either, but it, for the purposes of the discussion, it's, 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 a, it's a reasonable simplification. The key thing about the shape of the universe is that at the same time that it's expanding, it's also imploding. It's also shrinking at this center, except the center is everywhere. So instead of length or depth, i.e. three dimensions and a, and a single center, you can only understand this by thinking in terms of outwards and inwards. So all three dimensions outwards, all three dimensions in, inwards. I can, when I've got more time and in the course of a, in the course of a 
full presentation, this gets properly fleshed out and it becomes a, a, a straightforward series of steps from uncertainty to certainty. But I don't have time to do that at the moment. So all I can do is create interest. Let me see if I can continue to do that. We've, we've made a video that shows the effect of the shape of the universe. And that video starts with an, a visualization of the creation of the universe. And it refers to it as a, as a, unfortunately, it sounds humorous. Let's call it the long bong instead of the big bang. So there's a video that you can see right now that, that, that shows the results on gravity over the 12 billion year history of the universe and specifically of the Milky Way uh, over that time. The bottom line, dark energy has a north and a south. It's not just one thing. It's not just, ex it's not just straightforward expansion. You can think of it in gravitational terms as being the equivalent of the difference between cars accelerating away from each other and skydivers falling to earth and towards each other. There's one that so there's not only attraction with gravity, there's also separation with gravity and it works like north and south poles on a magnet. There's no way to determine which is which, except in reference to something that is known already. And finally, we can, we can visualize this. We can, we visualize, it's very easy to visualize because it does make gravity, it does make gravity fundamentally, it's operating in a two dimensional conceptual space. It's not, it's not, a, there's no, there's not really any need for the twisting of space time and so forth. I don't, that does happen. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to dispute that, but there isn't a need to understand that. So in, in visualizing how the Milky Way was formed, as we, as we saw in our video, we did that using effectively two dimensional modeling. So just, it's only a visualization, it's not mathematical, but the important thing is that the visualization is very straightforward and therefore the mathematics ought to drop out of that naturally. We've got videos also which explore uh, in much more depth the implications for a long-term non-Star Trek future, which I'm very proud of, even though they're going to look horribly dated now. Um, be lovely to remake those sometime. And then even over and above all of that, we've got something else that drops out of an understanding of the shape of the universe, nothing to do with physics, everything to do with metaphysics, because it's, it's effectively, I believe it's uh, reasonable to claim that it's effectively a definition of mind. So if you wanted to think of the shape of the universe as a theory of everything, you would need to you would need to consider the possibility that it's actually a theory of everything and everyone. It might be premature, but it might also help contextualize things. If I sort of take a step back and look back over the work that I've done. So how, how did I piece together the chain of reasoning that led me to the conclusion I've reached? I already mentioned one weakness of cosmology, which is looking at um, things that happened at different times as if they're like stills or still pictures where everything else is exactly the same. It's just, it's, it's just a different picture. Whereas actually the film has changed over the time. So it's a series of, it's a series of stills from a feature film. When I talk about the rate of expansion changing, clearly I'm talking about a continuous function. I'm not talking about a, 
a series of steps. We've made very, very heavy use of philosophy in understanding the shape that we have got and, and being confident that the results we had would turn out to be mathematically and exp experimentally correct without the traditional proof. Well, that's called philosophy. There's a weakness in current philosophy, which I think this reveals, which is there's, a, there's too much of a reliance on proof and too little belief, faith in, in, in truth based on our best possible assumption. So, for example, uh, Newton made an assumption that gravity was a force, which was completely reasonable at the time. And Einstein uh, built on that assumption that gravity was a force with, with his work in, in four-dimensional time space. That's, that's fine at the time, but now it's no longer the case. So we don't criticise the assumption that was made at the time. How, how could we? But we do replace the assumption with a better assumption. And the better assumption is very, very simple because it is simply that instead of gravity is like acceleration, gravity is acceleration. That's all it is. And that's, and, and that's, and, and that's not apparent because the universe doesn't have a background. So that completes this film. I hope it's We've covered a lot of, lot of ground, but the advantage of a video is that you can uh, you can review it at, 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 at repeatedly at, at, at leisure. Uh, so uh, it would be very appropriate to uh, bring any questions that you've got to the live shows which we're doing, which you can book on this website, and that will.